Hey, welcome to this episode of the Complete Advisor Podcast. Uh, this is a very special uh, episode. We have two very honored guests. Uh, but what we're going to talk about today is we're going to talk about, you know, I, th I think we'll frame this as understanding clients and helping clients understand themselves. Because um, I at one time was a, a, an amateur financial advisor, and I say that because I'm in this chair now. <laughs> uh, I'm not out there in private practice. But one of the things that you would run into is you would run into uh, the situation where you're talking to a client and you're making the decisions that are in the best interest because you're objectively looking at them. And on the other side of the table, you've got somebody who's almost philosophically fighting themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a little bit like, you know, if we wanted to have, if we wanted to have six pack abs, we could eat broccoli and the right amount of protein. And that would be the absolute best for us, but we still reach for Twinkies. Yeah. And so understanding how we make these decisions, I think is fascinating. So here we are. Um, and if I've totally framed this incorrectly. <laughs> ah, that's fine. Perfect. All right. So <laughs> I'm sitting across from Wade Fowl and Alex, I, I'm going to mispronounce your last name. Mergia. Mergia. Okay. I have said about six it, variations. It's totally fine. It. Uh, and you are the gentleman behind Risa. And so I don't want to butcher the next part. So, Wade, why don't you go ahead and explain to the audience what Risa is for those people mm -hmm. that haven't heard about it? Sure. Sure. So the Risa is the Retirement Income Style Awareness, and it's a framework. It's a questionnaire that uh, seeks to understand what sort of factors resonate with individuals as they approach retirement. To think about this broader question of what sort of retirement strategy would they like to implement? How do they want to source assets for their basic expenses in retirement? Mm -hmm. Known for a long time that there's different approaches out there for funding a retirement income plan, whether it's using a diversified investment portfolio, whether it's using a bucketing styled approach, whether it's using annuities to build a floor of protected lifetime income. And with the research I've done, it started with first questioning because so much of the consumer media is focused on investments only, the, mm -hmm. the total returns approach, and pointing out some of the risks in that approach that weren't always appreciated because when you transition into retirement, it's a very different world from the pre-retirement wealth accumulation that was just being extrapolated. But at the end of the day, there are different viable approaches. So how does someone want to select from those approaches? And that's where the questionnaire we developed built a framework around understanding the preferences people have for income and how that then translates into what ultimately the punchline is about two thirds of Americans from repeated national studies do seek strategies that provide some sort of contractual protection or commitment mm -hmm. that a pure investments based approach doesn't provide. And so as a starting point for conversations around retirement, that's when the annuity conversation can resonate better. And it's not for everyone, but it's for a, a large, a significant portion of the population that's not currently receiving that message in the consumer media. Yeah. And I would add, add to this, and this goes back to what you said earlier. We're definitely like that abs mm -hmm. like the Suzanne Summer thing, <laughs> uh, six-pack ad. No, no. Uh, what I would say is you talked about an advisor trying to act in their client's best interest. Mm -hmm. And with an assessment tool, I mean, what we realize, since there's many ways to source retirement income, mm -hmm. the underlying assumption here is there's many ways to get it right, retirement income. And if you don't assumption. believe in that, then just, I don't know. <laughs> put on Muzak or something like that, but no, but uh, instead of the pocket. At, at the end of the day, there's, there's many ways to get this retirement income right, mm -hmm. right? So we, we all hardly believe in that. Now, you're talking about advisors trying to act in the client's best interest. You can't act in the client's best interest if you don't ask them what those interests are. Good point. <laughs> you know, ultimately. And what we've done with, with ERISA is created a systemized assessment tool to really source you know, uh, systematically what those interests are, which then lead to a retirement strategy. Now, I have to ask you, um, this, right, this will be a softball here, I think, but uh, I was reading up on it a little bit. And so one of the first things that I always think of is like, well, okay, so what about accuracy? How do people feel yeah. after? And you guys did a survey after the fact of um, uh, several hundred people that had taken the research. Sure, sure. There's When you're creating these tools, there's two... With my psychologist hat on, there's two things you always want to make sure that a, a measure has. Because mm -hmm. if not, you're just really taking some Facebook quizzical, like what Avengers character are you in the in in the world of retirement? You know that kind of thing. Yep. Wade is the Green Lantern, by the way. Really? But uh, no, but uh, there's two things you want to keep track of: reliability and validity. Mm -hmm. Reliability is that 
you get on the weight scale and it, unfortunately it tells me I'm the same weight every time I get on and off, you know, that kind of, you want it though to be consistent, right? Mm-hmm. So that's reliability. Yeah, validity is, is it measuring what you intend to measure? You know, you want a measure of intelligence to measure intelligence, mm-hmm. not some other construct. And so with the RISA, your, your, your question speaks of validity. I mean, I'm sorry, reliability. Is mm-hmm. it consistent? We had a test retest, which means we gave it to a subset of folks actually during the pandemic. And it wasn't, it was like thousands or so, you know, during the pandemic. And then we retested them during the fall when things, there was a light at the end of the tunnel, the market had already recovered, Mm -hmm. and there were no differences in scores. So it was a very consistent trait, if you will, because we've also done that with cohorts. And cohorts is just a fancy way of saying age groups. Right, or, or groupings of people, but we did with age groups, like people in their 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s. There is no differences in the distribution of the RISA scores, meaning there's an equal number of people that want retire, that want income protection versus total return, et cetera, et cetera. It's, it's a very similar distribution across all these different age groups. You would think maybe that you take the risk questionnaire, which has very poor reliability, you know, it, mm-hmm. I'll make mm-hmm. other heroic assumptions that work, but whatever. I'm not going <laughs> to yeah. get into that right now. But they have poor reliability, right? That, you know, the older you get, the more risk averse you get. Here, it's very consistent. So what you're really asking yourself from this standpoint is the RISA measuring a trait or a state. A state is I'm angry, I'm happy. Mm-hmm. Those are more transient, right? A trait is I'm an introvert. I'm an extrovert. And could, there could be, you know, environmental differences that cause you to tweak or not tweak that. But ultimately, you're, we're really coming to that we're measuring a trait with the RISA, which is very interesting because when you're doing that, then you're really, you really can make the jump that, listen, we're measuring how somebody wants to source retirement income based on these preferences of these factors, probability, safety first, commitment, orientation, and optionality. And those are factors that do, just don't anchor themselves to the world of finance. It, it anchors themselves to decision trade-offs that you do in everyday life as well. Mm-hmm. And so what you're seeing here is that the, these are good traits that you can use to then you know, identify how that person wants to source retirement income. Gotcha. Now, it w- I would be remiss if I did not brag about the two of you a little bit, because there's a chance that people in the audience may not know who you are, which would be crazy. But so uh, let me well, in crazy properly. maybe for Wade, not for me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, so you, you, you mentioned Wade. Um, <laughs> described as a one-man think tank. I'm reading a little bit of bio here. It is awesome. But Depends on the think tank, right? Yeah. No. A <laughs> <laughs> Green Lantern think tank. Uh, but professor of retirement income at the American College uh, of Financial Services. Very impressive. Um, you lead the, I didn't know this, you lead the curriculum for the uh, RICP program, which fascinating. And then a partner at McLean uh, Asset uh, Management and mm-hmm. Retirement Researcher, PhD, uh, and apparently the Green Lantern. <laughs> and then over, so how did you connect with Alex? That goes back about 10 years. Uh, in a previous life, Alex was creating a, a general financial planning software and brought me in to help with building out the retirement income side of that. And we don't, we're not actively involved with that anymore, but we maintain the relationship. And now kind of round two here with the retirement income style of earnings. Yeah, I, I, and just for Wade, I mean, as much as Wade has all these accolades, it, but I, 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 no, I, I would say he's more than anything. He's just a, he's a super nice guy. He's a great guy. And I so, was worried what was going to say. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> Is this life? No, no. He's a great guy. I, I mean, it, people don't realize this, but he's the most approachable guy you could ever have. And, and so, if you ever have the opportunity to work with someone like Wade, and you know, on a professional level, you just kind of like try to corral him in. And so yeah. once we met, we were like, hey, Wade, look what we got here. Why don't you join us at McLean? And then, you know, things just developed from there. Which means if, if Wade's asking you to join, that means, of course, you're no slouch because you graduate uh, George Washington University doctorate in clinical uh, psychology, which is fascinating. Uh, research fellow for the National Institutes of Health. You get into investment and boom, here you are. Yeah, kind of. That's pretty much it. <laughs> that is super cool. I still was when you I was said, a film major. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> If you want to even go <laughs> wider. <laughs> <laughs> so what caused you, as you're, as you're sitting out there, Wade, you've, you've put out a lot of papers, you've done a lot of work. What was the uh, impetus to get started with RISA? What pushed that ball? Yeah, it, well, I was a traditional economist uh, looking at the pension systems of developing market countries. I was actually living in Japan, wanted to move back to the U.S. 
found retirement income as a new field within financial services, immediately came to learn that there's these really opposed schools of thought within retirement income. There, I call them the probability-based school of thought and the safety-first school of thought. And so for years, just navigating how to, like, you give a basic question and you hear completely opposite answers based on who you're talking to. And so for a long time, this was kind of something in the back of my mind. And then uh, with Alex, Alex was initially thinking we need some sort of checklist for uh, what do you need to do for retirement? But yeah. that evolved into a research project. Could we actually figure out whether people resonate with one approach or another? And it, it really just developed there as an educational tool at first, but we realized that advisors actually value this. And uh, in the consumer media, the, the investments approach gets so much attention. So mm -hmm. this really, and, and we're agnostic. So some people may like that investments approach, but this brings a, a seat to the table for annuities to be yeah. part of that conversation yeah. as well. Alex, do you think the investment approach gets so much attention in the media because that's what people want to talk about at a cocktail party? Mm -hmm. Other stocks did? I don't know. I, I think it has more to do with uh, the monetary uh, endpoint that the advisor can can get from it. I yes, investments are kind of the hot topic because sure. they're on CNBC and you can talk about it. But uh, one of one of my soapboxes is uh, as much as I, I, I think annuity folks are paying for the sins of their fathers. Absolutely. You know, I I really believe that a model investment portfolio is so productized right now mm -hmm. that. Model portfolios are the things that are sold, not bought, mm -hmm. right now. And because, I mean, I mean, point blank, that's what it is. It's, it's a product. It's, mm -hmm. it's not this, oh, it's this investment process. No, it's a, they productized it okay. effectively right now. And so I think it's, it's the thing that's hot right now. It's, it's, the, it's becoming kind of the, one of the main things, simply because the way it can be transitioned. Before the rise of model portfolios, it was much more labor intensive, et cetera, et cetera. Now it's just a model portfolio. You put, you buy it on a marketplace, and off you go, mm -hmm. right? By the way, uh, one percent in advance. Mm -hmm. You know that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. It's it's a great model, and so I think that's why you see uh, a lot of it now, more so, and that's why folks get get beyond just asking how do you want to source retirement income. Mm -hmm. They treat everything like an accumulation based portfolio, and even though somebody's in decumulation, they ignore the new risk that come into play. And I'm not using the word ignore lightly. They ignore the new risks that come into play and they just continue what they're doing because it's easy. Well, I'm sorry. I know that was, no, <laughs> that's, that's a little bit of a button for me where, you know, no. it's not a joking kind of thing. It's like, look, it's, I think it's actually, a, I don't think it's a good thing that, that the, the way the, the industry is going with regards to putting everyone in like a model portfolio and calling it a day. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, uh... I'd say lazy, but it's uh, yeah. It's no, a, it's a, I will. It's a lazy way <laughs> of doing it, and and I'm not. Look, I'm not. Our firm, you know, has a lot of total return. I'm no, we're not against total return at all. Yeah, it's a viable approach for some that identify with it, but I think we're jamming people with it when it's not appropriate as an industry. That is, you know, we do we do fall down these paths of uh, broadly speaking, and I'm not including myself yeah, in yeah, it, but yeah, it's it is pretty easy to do that where there's a school of thought. Everyone gets maybe a little lazy thinking things through follows it follows it now we do this now we do that i think there's also an era of holier than thou mm -hmm. component to it where i'm a fiduciary so i only do things you know in this manner but again you can't act in your client's best interest you don't ask them what those interests are and if somebody really wants a structured investment outcome then you know who are you to, to say no that is a very, you know, you just made a, you made a very interesting point. So back when, that back. Did we just take this, did we just take this podcast? Did we just take a left turn? We took a left turn. We totally did, but that's totally okay. We, you know, during DO, the beginning phases of DOL on our side of the fence here uh, in the, in the non, in the, the non-registered, the registered world, um, the, the different standards, the different products, I really feel that having to look like uh, phase one of it, where you had to look at all products, all options really meant for those people. I'm going way off on this one. Fine. But there, there were those folks that wouldn't look at a certain subset of products that all of a sudden, technically, you're supposed to be looking at all of that. Now they have a seat at the table. And like you said before, in relation to annuities in particular, and I'm going way back. This is the 90s back here. Sure. A diff different century. That's why I'm putting my hand so far yeah, out. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> but the products that we were working with back in the 90s are just 
they couldn't even show their face today. They're so there's such a difference in in what they were and how they perform. And uh, well, that's my point about their. Yeah. You know, I think annuities are paying for the sins of their fathers, but the reality is markets work. And over time, they, you know, better solutions are, are created for the end consumer. And if you're an advisor and you're not even looking that way, then, you know, there is a road to Damascus moment that you're avoiding. Mm-hmm. Just mm-hmm. is. Yeah, and I've been able to build a career really around just the idea that retirement income <laughs> is, a, is a distinct field within financial services. And there's these different risks. And if you just apply the same wealth accumulation mindset, post-retirement, you're not necessarily navigating through those risks in the most efficient manner. And that's full stop how I've been able to build a career. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then bring it, and then you bring this guy into the mix. Yeah. <laughs> Looking off, off into the distance with that photo. Um, so what has the, re, the reaction been? How have uh, advisors been receiving and using Risa? I think for advisors that have been doing, well, great, no. <laughs> no, it, we, we, it's a very auspicious start. You know, I'll leave it at that. But advisors that have been, you know, they, where their, their main business is contractual income, annuities, they finally have found something that can bring up annuities in a very neutral way mm-hmm. to, uh, mm-hmm. to a client. Because we're not, you take the reset, it doesn't say get an annuity, do you want an annuity, yes or no. It's just asking you characteristics of how you want to source retirement income. And there's, you know, it, it becomes pretty obvious at face value that if you answer it a certain way, this is a solution you're looking for. Yep. And that kind of neutrality is something that these advisors are really clinging to because it puts them in a position of being a curator mm-hmm. of sorts. They're guiding you through a journey mm-hmm. and it, it says, well, this is the path then kind of thing. For uh, advisors that are a total return that have seen this, the AUM advisors, there's been a surprisingly high number of those advisors. Now you can say that just the fact that they're using the reset, it pulls for certain personalities. But there's a high number of advisors that are recognizing, you know what, I need to amplify the purview of my practice mm-hmm. because all I'm doing is total return and I'm realizing that there's new risk in retirement to their credit. They're saying, I realize there's new risk in retirement, so I have to start considering other things because, okay. you know, I'm, a ha- I'm just a hammer right now mm-hmm. and I need to be a little bit more. You're seeing that quite a bit. That is such an interest. It's interesting to hear that analogy used for yeah, IARs yeah, yeah. versus the other. The, well, it used to always go back the other way towards the non But it goes back to what I said before. And I, I, a model portfolio is now a product. Mm-hmm. Make no mistake about it. They're charging it with AUM and they're waving their flag of fiduciary. And no, oh, look at me, right? But no, mm-hmm. it's a product. It just is. I mean, you, you, you can... In fact, it's, it's, it's an e- and it's, yeah, it is. I mean, when you could go to a marketplace and select these model portfolios and off you go, it's a product. Yeah. And so it's, got, it's falling in the same, you know, it, it's going through the same processes of, of, of any productized thing within the financial service industry. And many times that's not necessarily good. And if you're, and if you're not bringing, uh, since we're taking left turns in this yeah. podcast all over the place, uh, you've got like, you know, the, the rise of AI. If you can commoditize something and anybody can pick that out without really getting into know somebody. Um, well, think about play. how easy uh, to go for the products. Think about how easy. I'm going to ask you three questions. How, how smart are you? How well can you sleep at night? And, <laughs> and whatever, right? And from those three questions, without doing anything at all, I'm going to slot you into a model portfolio and call it a day. And collect 1%. And collect 1% in advance. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know? Come on. Yeah, you know what I mean? Like, as opposed to an annuity, even though it's a better product, it's a contract. So it, because it's a contract, it's mm-hmm. just not a, a press button thing. Yep. And yep. so now it becomes, yeah, it's just not worth the aggravation. I'm just going to slot you into this. And guess what? I'm going to start saying, well, that's how I have to be because I'm a fiduciary. That's, so, that's not, come on. Right? We know that you, it's one of those, I know that you know, and I know that you know that this is a clean podcast, so I'll just stop right there. No, no, we have, we've had one curse word in the uh, history of the, the complete advisor. I was close to making it two. Just, just do it. Just, I could have used you. Oh, I could have really used you guys. Where were you in about 2006? I was sitting clients across the table, and um, oh, actually, let's call it 2010. Uh, time flies, right? Uh, City across the table. Everything that they said they needed for their portfolio, they're getting ready to retire. Income yeah, yeah. guaranteed. I'm thinking, okay, great, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sell one of these products, an annuity. And uh, I describe it, we get to the end, they're like, we really like everything you say, as long as it's not an annuity, we'll do it. So that goes back so. to your marketing question. <laughs> yep. 
you know, at the beginning. And now I, I get why. I will say this, going back to this, and you've seen it. If you look at the, you know, you, you try to get the, a, a sense of the zeitgeist, right, mm -hmm. in the press. I'll ask you, who are the bad guys in the press right now? Mm. Who do you think? Are they, I have my own opinion. Man, if you go into the press, I, uh, it's the stock guys. It's the stock guys. What you're seeing to me yeah. is it's no longer a thing to write about commissions. or It's like, okay, we get the joke. You know, all right, mm -hmm. you know, you're not going to write. Right now, the people that are just getting arrows flung at them, if you see, if you read like, you know, Jason Zweig or this or that, it's all, mm -hmm. why are you paying 1% for an advisor? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. End of story. Mm -hmm. Bogleheads. Oh, you know? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, why are you paying whatever for an advisor? You're a moron. You can just get, you know, whatever, a model portfolio and call it a day. Yes, the advisor has value. Yes, the advisor is your friend or whatever, you know. But it, it, it becomes one of those things. And so I think a reckoning is coming on that end, a, a major way, because you're just seeing it bubbling up. You don't see an article that goes by every quarter where someone's not saying, are you just paying one, are you paying 1% for an investment portfolio? Well, this is what you're throwing away over the course of yep. a career. Now, don't get me wrong. I think advisors that do planning and, and things along those, there's tremendous value to be had. But I'm not talking about logic now. I'm just talking about marketing. Mm -hmm. you know? And those guys are getting handed it to them right now. Mm -hmm. Well, those guys and girls, those, <laughs> equal gender equal. inclusive, right? Everyone's getting handed it to them right now. And if you ask me, unless you have something you know, that it, unless you have a more expansive purview of what you can offer, mm -hmm. think you're, think you're going to be in trouble. I had a, uh, I had a, a business coach on, um, on the podcast that I love, and he said, I, I asked him what he thought about maybe the next 10 years challenges. And he said, here's what I see for financial advisors. I see that maybe a third of them will be out of business uh, because of advances in AI, advances in do-it-yourselfing. Uh, the other third will end up uh, working, getting a salary and then maybe a bonus at the end of the year working for some big house. And then the last third will be the ones that are the folks that embrace, create experiences, and, and probably use a tool like, like Risa. Yeah, I, I don't know about the third going out of business. Do you? I, I mean, just because everyone has said that, you've been in the business long enough. I, um, I started to know one. It's always been someone saying something like that. So, I don't, so I don't know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? But yeah, I mean, look. At the end of the day, to the degree that an advisor is niched down and the advisor is providing a more compelling experience, I think, I think that works. I'm curious, and I'm coming at it, think about it, my background is clinical psychologist, right? Mm -hmm. But I mm -hmm. wanted, wanted out of that kind of profession. <laughs> Not wanted out, but, you know, I moved on from that. And now it's, it's funny. It's kind of like this profession is moving to you. It's, yeah, it's moving <laughs> yeah. this way, right? And they're looking at me like I'm some expert. I don't know nothing about therapy or anything like that. But the point being that, there's this movement right now about embracing the, the money value or the, the soft sense of things, and I get that. Yeah. But I'm curious how successful those folks are going to be ultimately because I do think people want competence. And the people that embrace yeah. that sort of, I'm your best friend and I'm going to sort of tell you everything about money because I know what money means to you and we're really going to get into it and I'm your life coach, you know, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's going to work out if you don't know how to do a Roth conversion at the end well, of the day. Because yeah. a lot of these folks strike me as lightweights I, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> when I hear them speak. Lightweights on the financial planning side, and I don't know if that gives. I don't know if your business coach was talking about those guys as well. But, you know, I'm always skeptical. So I'm, I'm curious how, how they end up doing. I think they're doing good work, but I don't think that's necessarily... Well, yeah, I mean, you know. <laughs> you're right. You, I mean, you have to have the core competency. Otherwise, you're, otherwise you're just out the door. And I don't get the sense that they do. I don't know, just Wade. part of a team, though, the increasing movement towards teams. You think? You've got the behind-the-scenes person doing the calculations. And the <laughs> I think you're just being nice, Wade, because we make fun of the same people all the time. When, when you, do, oh, well, you send me pictures of people, oh, look what this guy not. said. And I'm like, yeah, incredible. Yeah. <laughs> 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 well, he's the quiet assassin, like you said. Trust me. I like it. I like it. Let me ask you one other uh, one other thought here, and then I'll, we've got a. Um, unfortunately, we've got a wrap, but I could stay in here for hours. Um, do you think, Wade? Do you think with uh, with Risa? Do you think that it'll make a case for? Uh, or it'll it'll actually impact the amount of um, fee based annuities that gets. 
Uh, I well, I think yeah, that's a popular area right now. Is just the rise of the fee-based annuities, and so a natural audience is the traditional RIA firm that may mm-hmm. have used only investments, but now that they can integrate annuities into their practices as well, there's definitely yeah, I, I think that is going to be an area where we'll see growth. Now it's because the commission-based annuity world is so much larger yeah. than the fee-only world, you still find best-in-class op- opportunities within the commission world. So you, you can't overlook that. But at least for the RAA firm that's starting to get their feet wet with thinking about annuities, the fee-based options are a good way to, to get started in that direction for sure. Yeah, it definitely will be because there is a, there is a batter of... Um of them coming around philosophically to annuities because they're they're fee based and you know, the part of the whole part of the whole premise is you know I'm you know, the market goes up yeah, if yeah, you yeah. do well I do well if if it doesn't then I get a, a cut and pay that's so much should have a commercial on that if you do well, well. <laughs> I've never said it before <laughs> <laughs> I, I think in general though it'll increase the resale will increase that just because it's introducing the whole concept of structured income regardless of the compensation model it it brings it into the forefront. Well, I'm excited to, uh, I I got two things. So I'm excited to watch and see the growth and the rise of the RISA. Uh, And I'm also excited to have you guys back on the podcast a second time, because unfortunately we have to, we have to wrap up. But um, guys, thank you so much for being on the podcast. No, and and I'm sure Wade and I concur on on your points as well, (laughs) especially the first one. (laughs) But happy to do the second. Awesome. Yeah, no, it's great. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.